Welcome to the Community Church Podcast. My name's Alan Cleveland. I'm the lead pastor at Community Church, and it's so great to have you uh, join with us as we explore God's Word today. So good to be with you this morning. Welcome to uh, Community Church, and um, welcome to our brothers and sisters down in Winter Haven who are watching this online. We are jealous because uh, it is cold here, and we got more snow coming on the forecast, and all of that stuff uh, of being a part of uh, living here in the Midwest. And so, um, so we're glad that you're here this morning. And uh, this is week two, the final week of a series called Love Does. And uh, we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 3. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, and uh, our ushers can get you a copy of God's Word. We're going to be uh, jumping in and, and picking up where we were last week. Uh, we started looking at this, this idea of, of God's love for us, Right? And, uh, and I want to look uh, back, just as a reminder, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it says this, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. Remember this last week, that John is like, look, 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 see God's love, look at God's love. Focus on God's love. The kind of love that what? That gives, right? That God's love gives. And, and so we talked about this love that God has given to us, that we should be called what? What does it say? That we should be called children of God. You guys had more sleep than the first service. You guys should be ready to go, right? That we should be called children of God. That God calls us his children. Here, here's the thing. Uh, if you knew Heather and I, okay, if you knew my wife Heather and I, um, but you didn't know our kids, and we all got together and there's lots of kids and all the kids are out in the lobby, you, it wouldn't take you long to distinguish which kids are ours, right? Because, because here's the thing. The apple doesn't what? doesn't fall far from the tree, right? So, so our kids are vertically challenged. So here's the deal. Heather and I, five foot nothing, okay? So they don't have a, now Jacoby, we adopted Jacoby from Ethiopia. So Jacoby, he's, got a, he's getting close, right? So he's going to mess up this illustration in the next couple of years. But for right now, all, all of our kids are Kramer kids. And you'd be like, yep, that's a Kramer kid. None of my kids have an inside voice. Like if you, if you walked by our house, you'd be like, is everything okay in there? Like, like it's, it's crazy, all right? Um, one of, another one of the things with our kids is that they, they, um, they're really hard-headed. They don't want to learn the easy way, right? Does anybody have one like that? Like, maybe you, maybe you have one like that. God didn't bless us with one of those, okay? And, and so, and to, I'm sure my mom is really happy about that, actually. She's probably like, you're getting what you deserve, okay? But, but here's the reality. Like, our characteristics uh, should look like our parents, Right? And, and it's, it's the same with God's children. So in this passage, 1 John chapter 3, look what it says. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Look at this, verse 2. Beloved, loved ones. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know. This is what we know for sure. That when he appears, what's it say? We shall be like him. You're just going to be like God. And so last week we said that God is love. And if God is love, then his sons and daughters should be love, right? If God is love and we are his children, we are his sons and daughters, then we should be people of love. That's what we're going to unpack here today. Last week we looked at, there's 105 verses in the book of 1 John. 51 times the word love is used. So once, almost every other verse, the word love is used. Now, out of 51 times of the word love being used, 10 of those times, John is urging these followers to love one another. Did you hear that? So one out of five times that the word love is used in 1 John, one out of five times, the word is used to encourage or challenge people to love one another. I don't know about you, but it's not easy to love people sometimes, is it? Right? I heard a mm-hmm over here. Right? Like, hopefully that wasn't your spouse. Right? Like sometimes, listen, it's hard to love people sometimes. There's, there's difficult people out there. And, and God is going to call us to love people the way that he loves us. And so last week, laying this foundation of God is love, 
This is how God loves us. And now we're going to start to look at practically, how do we love other people? How do we love one another? So 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, verse 11, here it is. Listen to this. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. This is the message you've heard from the beginning. What does that tell us about this message that he's going to give us? Is it a new message? It's not new, okay? So this isn't like, oh, wow, I never heard that before. Listen, he says, this is not new. This is something you've heard from the beginning. This is kindergarten Christianity. This is walking with Jesus 101. And so what does he say? For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning. What does your Bible say? That we should what? That we should love one another. That we should love one another. And this whole thing, this picture of God's love flowing through us to other people should be the mark of the church. Did you hear me? God's love flowing through us. God is love. His children should love. God's love flowing through us should, should characterize us as the church. I almost did this this past week, but I, I felt like, man, I'm going to be really embarrassed by the answer. If we went downtown Oshkosh and we asked 100 people, we surveyed 100 people and said, if, when you think of a follower of Jesus, what is the one characteristic that comes to your mind? I wonder if love would even be in the top five. Because there's a lot of things that people think about Christians. There's a lot of things that people think about church people. And a lot of times, love isn't one of them. And yet what this is saying is that the church, God's people, should be marked by love. They should be characterized by love. There should be a radical contrast a radical difference between the church and the world. And that's exactly what John tries to show us in these verses, okay? So we're in this series called Love Does, all right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to contrast hate does with love does, okay? So here's what hate does. Look at your, look at your Bible, verse 12. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. And so John, here's what John does. To contrast the, the, the world, what the world is characterized by, okay, and what God is characterized by, he goes back to the first brothers to show us what hate does. He shows us what hate does. Now, you know the story, right? If you don't, you can go back to Genesis chapter 4 and you can read about this story. But Cain and Abel, the first brothers, right? They bring sacrifices to God. They both bring a sacrifice to God. And God accepts Abel's sacrifice and he rejects Cain's. Now, I don't know if it was because of the sacrifice or it was because of the motive, but the bottom line is this. Instead of being happy for his brother, what does Cain do? What does Cain do? He writes a nasty note. What does he do? He kills him. He murders him. Do you understand? Like, like John is saying, hey, I want to show you the difference between the world and, and God. And he goes back to these first two brothers and he says, look at Cain. Don't be like Cain. The anger that was, that was welling up inside of his heart because he didn't get what he wanted. Cain ignored God's warning. Did you know that God warned him? God, God looked at Cain and he said, listen, sin is crouching at the door. Be careful. Be careful that you, that, that, of what's going on in your heart right now. And Cain ignores God's warning and he murders his brother. Why? Where did this hatred come from? Did it come from Satan? Did it come from their parents? I mean, Adam and Eve, they took the apple, they, they sinned, right? No, what does the verse say? It came from what? His own evil desires, his own heart, his own affection. So listen, sin didn't start in the garden. Or, or sin, the, the hatred that's in your heart, that's not because of what happened in the garden. It's not because of Satan. It's because of your own evil desires. James chapter 2, verse 14. James, or James chapter 1, verse 14, each person is tempted 
when they are lured and enticed by their own evil desires. What happens to Cain? He murders his brother, and what happens to him? God sends him off, it says, as a fugitive and a wanderer. You know what that means? Is he with people? No, he's alone. You know what hate does? It divides. Hate divides. It separates. It isolates us. It, and, and many of you know exactly what we're talking about because you've experienced it in your own life, right? You had a relationship with somebody and, and something went wrong. They treated you wrong. They did something to you. And listen, I'm not making light of what they did to you. And I'm not saying that what they did to you is okay. But, but listen to me. God makes a very clear contrast be, be, between how we respond as God's people and how we respond as people who follow our own evil desires. Because if if we follow the hate that's in our heart, the only thing it's going to do is continue to divide and separate and isolate. Hate divides. Jesus warns these believers. Look at verse 13. He says, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Here's the, here's the deal. Some people are really hard to love. Amen? Amen? That's a unanimous amen, right? Some people are hard to love, okay? Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus love people who were hard to love? It's good news, isn't it? Did Jesus love messy people? What if, what if Jesus didn't love people who were difficult to love? What if he didn't love messy people? How many people would be in this room right now if Jesus didn't love messy people? Universal symbol? Zero, right? We wouldn't be here. Listen, this room is filled with people who have have hurts and habits and hang-ups. We're we're a mess. And, And what we said last week was this. While we were still sinners, while you were still a mess, while you still had hurts and hang-ups and 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 habits, God still loved you. When I focus on the fact, this is what helps me. When I focus on the fact that God loves me despite me, it helps me to love other people despite them. Despite what they did to me. Despite how they hurt me. Despite what they took from me. If I focus on the fact that God loved me despite me, I can love other people the same way. I'm not saying it's easy. But if I keep that in the back of my mind, it gets a little bit easier. Hate divides. If if hate divides, then what does love do? What does it do? It, it, It connects, right? It unites. It brings us together. So here's what love does. It unites. It Instead of causing separation, it actually brings people together. Why? Because love is selfless. Because God's kind of love is a selfless love. It lays aside its selfish desires, its self-sacrificing, its commitment that seeks the good of others. Doesn't that sound awesome? I mean, don't, don't you want to be around people who love like that? Who wouldn't want, I mean, wouldn't you want to be around people who love like that? It's okay, you, it's kind of selfish to say yes, but that's okay. Right? We want, to be, we want to be around people who are, who are selfless. Who think of us before they think of themselves. That's the kind of love that unites. Jesus prayed a prayer in the Gospels and he prayed to, to his Father. He said, Father, would they be one? Would they be unified? Would they be marked by their love for one another? You know what I was thinking about this week? Satan is not afraid of big churches. Did you know that? Now, as as a pastor, one of the things that we desire is to see our church grow, right? 
Like, we, there's empty seats here. We want to see every seat filled. We want to add another service. We want to expand this building. We want to expand our impact. We, we want to uh, plant other churches or start other sites. We want, listen, we want community church to grow because we, we know that healthy things grow. But you know what we need to keep in the back of our mind? Satan's not afraid of a big church. Satan's afraid of a unified church. You hear me? Satan is not afraid of this, all these seats being filled unless all these seats are filled with people who say, you know what, we're all about focusing on Jesus and being unified in him. Love unites. That's the contrast. That's the difference between what hate does and love does. And, that, and that's what John wants this, us to see. He wants us to see the difference between hate and love. And then he does this. How do we walk in love? How, how do we, how does love, what does love look like in action? And, and so he's going to unpack for us what it looks like to, to walk in love, okay? Here's the first thing. What does love look like in action? Number one, love is sacrificial. Love is sacrificial. Look at verse 16. By this we know love. So, so John says this. He says, you know how you can know? You know how you can know love? You know how you can know if somebody's a follower of Jesus? You know how you can know if, if someone is a son or a daughter of God? Look at this. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. When, when John speaks of love, he takes us to the, 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 the supreme example of love and he points us to the cross. He looks at what Jesus did on the cross. He says, if you want to know what love looks like, then look at the cross. Can you imagine how that conversation went down? In eternity past, right, when, when God the Father is laying out the plan of redemption, right, and he says, you know what, we're going to create people and they're going to be a mess. And they're going to rebel and they're going to reject and they're going to run away. And, and as, he's, as he's laying out this plan, he's, he says, you know what? But we need to bring them back. And the only way that we can show them how much we love them is we're going to, I'll tell you what, he huddles up the Holy Spirit and he brings Jesus in and he says, I got a plan. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to show them how much we love them. It's the cross. Can you imagine Jesus in that moment saying, you know what, hey, can we just send him a card and some flowers? Like, that would be a lot easier. But that's not what love does, is it? Love is sacrificial. Love gives until it has nothing left to give. Jesus shows us that love is sacrificial. John chapter 13, verse 34 Jesus said this, a new command I give you, love one another. And everybody in this room says, yeah, that makes sense. That's a good idea. We should love other people. We should love one another. Even, listen, even people who don't know Jesus, even people who are not Christians would say that that's a good idea. But you know what? That's not the end of that verse, is it? Jesus says, a new command I give you, to love one another as I have loved you. You. How did Jesus love us? Sacrificially. He went to the cross. He gave everything so that we could know that we are loved. Be honest. Look around the room for a second. Look around the room. Just look around the room. Like, I'm not doing it. You better look around the room. I want you to think for a moment. Would you lay down your life for the people in this room? And maybe for some of you, like, you know what? I'd lay my life down for my wife who's sitting right next to me. I'd lay my life down for my kids. I might even lay my life down for that person over there. They're, they're a pretty good person. But that, that guy? Oh, Jesus laid down his life. Why wouldn't you lay down your life for the people in this room? 
You know why? Because it's inconvenient. You've got, you've got plans, you've got dreams, you've got priorities, you've got other things that you want to accomplish, that you want to do, and, and to think of laying down your life for someone that you don't know or someone that doesn't care about you? One of the things that I've realized about myself, I'm, my kids are hard-headed because I'm hard-headed, it takes me a long time to realize things. But one of the things that I've realized over the years is that my love is conditional. That I, I love under conditions, okay? Let me give you an example. Heather and I go out for dinner, okay? And, and I order something new off the menu. Now, I don't do that a lot, right? Because I'm like, I know what this is. I know that I like it. I'm sticking with this. But I try something new on the menu, and, and she'll look over during the meal, and what will she say? Can I try that? Now listen to me. When it comes to food, I'll cut you. Like, I'm, I'm, don't touch my food, all right? But, but here's the deal. She's my wife, okay? And so I will lay down part of my life for her. And so I'll be like, you know what? That's, yeah, yeah, you can try a bite. But you know what always happens inside of me? This thought comes into my brain, right? And it starts to come around and these words start to come out of my mouth. And what do I say? Well, can I have some ears? Right? Because listen, if I'm going to give you some of mine, then I better be getting something in return. And listen, that's what love is conditional. That's the kind of love that we have in, in our culture. Love's the, the, love that kind of, the love that says, you know what, I'll love you if. Or I'll love you if I get something in return. That's not sacrificial love. Jesus said, I don't, I don't want you to love that way. I want you to love like I've loved you, sacrificially, not expecting anything in return. Love is sacrificial. Here's the second thing about love, that if we're going to live this out, love is practical. Love is practical. Look at verse 17. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Did, did you hear that? It's like, listen, if you have stuff, and you see somebody who doesn't have stuff, and you're like, you know what, I'll pray for them. You know what, you know what God just said to you? You don't have the love of God in you. If, here's the thing. Jesus saw a need, and he could meet that need and, and so he went through and he, he met that need. Love is practical. We've got to start thinking about, and I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying that if you, if you don't have the means to meet a need, then you don't do it. And you don't need to feel guilty about it. But if, if you see a need and you're like, you know what? I, I, I have to do something about it. I'm compelled to do something about it because God's love in me compels me to live that way. I had a lady before the first service come up to me. We have a, a group of students who are going to a, a camp this summer called Camp Barnabas. And it's a camp for kids with special needs. And she found out about it, I, I don't know, through, the face, through Facebook or, or through the website or what, but she found out about it. She came up to me this morning and she handed me a, a ridiculous check. And she said, I want you to use this for those kids going to Camp Barnabas. She saw a need, and she had the means to meet that need. That's the kind of church that we have. We have an incredibly generous church, a church that sees needs and meets them. That love is not just sacrificial. The love is practical. Here's the third thing. Love is substantial. Love is substantial. Look at verse 18. Little children, I love how he speaks to, to these adult followers of Jesus, right? He says, little children, Christianity 101. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Chew on that this week. Genuine love doesn't just talk, it acts. This, this whole series, love does. 
Love doesn't just talk about, if I came up to my kids and I, and I had them all huddle up and I said, hey, kiddos, I, I just want you to know daddy loves you so much. I'll see you at high school graduation. Like that, that's not love, right? We, we can't just say that we love our children. We have to, we have to do something about it. We got to act on it. Love is substantial. It does things. It doesn't just say things. What is John 3.16 without the cross? Think about it. For God so volume, so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If God says that in John 3.16 but then the cross doesn't happen, what is John 3.16? It's empty words. And we look around and we say, I I love you. God's called me to love you, but we don't do anything about it. That's not really love. And as John says, God's love doesn't abide in us. It doesn't live. It doesn't exist in us. Love requires action. Think about the Good Samaritan. You know the story, right? Right? The, the, the priest, the Levite, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. And they're all walking on the same road. And on this road, there's somebody that's been beaten and, and, and robbed. And they, they, all three of them walk by this same person who is, who is naked and bleeding. And it says that the priest came up and saw the, 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 the person on the road and, and crossed over the road and kept on going. The Levite comes along and sees the same thing and crosses over the road and and keeps on going. It's sort of like, man, I I hope they're okay, but they walk away. Hey, I'll pray for you. The Samaritan comes along. And what does the Samaritan do? Bandages, puts this person on his own donkey, takes them to an inn, gives the innkeeper money. Love is sacrificial. Love is practical. Love is substantial. You know what blows me away by that story? The priest and the Levite, they could stand up here right now and they could give an amazing message on love. They could give incredible sermons on love. And they could lay out, here are the points of love, and this is where we see the the redemptive love of God throughout history, and they could do all of that stuff. Listen to me. The guy on the side of the road didn't need a sermon. Love is substantial. Requires action. The church needs less declaring and more doing. What does that mean? As the worship team comes up, I want to think for a moment what that means for us. What what does it mean for us to walk in love? What does it mean for us to, to live out the love that God has for us towards one another? Here's what it means. It means being a friend to the one who has failed. It means being strong for someone who's weak. It means being patient with someone who's confused. It means accepting those who have been rejected. You know what it also means? It also means blessing those who bless others. See, a lot of times we focus on love and we we talk about these things in church and we're like, man, we just got to look for the broken people. We got to look for the hurting people. And that's true. Jesus came to heal broken people. But we forget about the people who are always blessing others. And and the way that we can love them is by saying thank you. Thank you for blessing other people. Thank you for taking care of those who can't take care of themselves. If we're going to be the church, 
If we're going to be the church, then we need to love one another the same way that Jesus loved us, sacrificially, practically, and substantially. Not just with words, but with action. Love does. We, we sang this song last week called The Passion. And, and I wanted you to look at um, I wanted you to look at this line last week about God's love for us. That, that, that as we look at the cross, there's no question about God's love for us. There's another line in this song, in, in the bridge. It's later on in the song, and you'll see it when it, when it comes up. But there's this, this line in the song that says this, I give my whole life. I give my whole life to honor this love, this love that God has for us. I give my whole life to honor that love. And that's what John is saying in these verses. He's saying, listen, don't just, don't just think about God's love. Don't just talk about God's love. Be God's love to the world. Not just with words, but with actions. Love does. Hey, thank you for watching. We trust that you were blessed by what you saw and experienced with God's word today. If you have a concern, a prayer request, or if you would like to participate financially in the ministry of Community Church, you can find that information on the church website. God bless you. Have a great week and shalom.